All right, friends, we're going to get started. It's one o'clock. Welcome. And today you are all here for a presentation from our friends from the California Native Plant Society. And this is part of our Bay Area Science Festival partnership, who is now in their 10th year. Check out their website. They have so much happening, all virtual, all ages, all free. So please, at four o'clock today, SFPL is hosting an author talk. So please come check that out. All right, and there is the author talk right there. Author Libby Copeland has written a book about DNA and all of the, a um, lot of science behind it, but also a lot of weirdness and strangeness and finding families and, you know, finding out you might be a parent and you didn't know, whoops. Um, so really interesting though. And she is gonna be in conversation with Alicia Zhao, who is a geneticist here in San Francisco and works for Color. And Color, you might um, recognize that name with the COVID testing. So come check that out. It's gonna be really interesting. There's those beautiful vote posters, our PSAs. Don't be complacent. One City, One Book for the 16th. One City, One Book is Chanel Miller. Please read the book, check it out at our library, or you may buy it from the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library online or from your local bookstore, which we love and support. Um, right now we are at eight locations and expanding, so you can get all those holds and that massive list that um, Susan created. So place some books on hold. There's also available in eBooks. And a PSA to protect all of our workers out there and yourself, wear your masks. We are at the tail end of Viva and it's been so amazing. I've had such a great time. We have one more event tomorrow and that is with uh, artist Calixto Robles. He's gonna tell us about his experience with Day of the Dead and how his family celebrated it. And he will be building an altar. This event will be in Spanish. Tomorrow is also the Before Columbus Awards. I'm always excited about book awards because I get to, you know, host amazing authors. So always amazing. And that's sure to be an interesting one. Next Wednesday, we have poetry and I'm gonna breeze through a lot of this, um, but we do have Angela Davis in conversation. Well, it's the other way around. Obviously, I'm, I'm very excited about Angela Davis. It's Isaac Julian in conversation with Angela Davis. And it's part of Julian's exhibit at the McCovey Foundation for the Arts. Um, he has a, a multidiscipline uh, screen, film, art, photographs um, based on Frederick Douglass and abolition. And they'll be talking about that. So please come check that one out. I mean, right? How amazing is that? And we want to thank our friends at the San Francisco Public Library. <clears throat> We also want to welcome all of you beautiful people here today and thank you for joining us and taking the time to be with us today on welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people. Uh, SFPL would like to acknowledge many Rangatish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards in the lands on which we reside here in the Bay Area. Uh, we also want to let you know that SFPL is not a neutral institution and stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Uh, the link that I put in the chat has a lot of information about Black lives and indigenous culture. So check that out. Um, and uh, that document link is just gets updated all the time whenever Susan and the California Native Plant Society is here with us. So I add resources, they add resources. So definitely pick up that link and I'll send a follow-up email to all registered attendees and it'll also have those links. And the number one question that gets asked, yes, this will be available on YouTube after this event. So you can check out this event as well as all of the uh, other three events that we've had since summer. Today, we will be talking, Susan will be talking about shade, I'm sorry, we'll be talking about gardening for biodiversity in San Francisco. San Francisco plants and wildlife, including beautiful butterflies, co-evolved together in a variety of plant communities on our varied soils and in our variable weather. These wildlife and plants are our biodiversity, the foundation of our ecosystem's health. And Susan's gonna discuss this. Susan Karasoff gardens in San Francisco's clay soil, 
She is a member of the California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena chapter. And she brings a system approach to build resilient local ecosystems and only the easiest plants survive approach to gardening. Susan grows a buffet of native edible and pollinator plants. And I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Susan now. All you, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Karasoff from the California Native Plant Society. Bob Hall from the California Native Plant Society is monitoring the Zoom Q&A and Anissa Malati from the library is monitoring the YouTube chat. This is part of the Bay Area Science Festival. There will be a lot of information today, much of it new in the past five years. This information will be available for review on YouTube so that you can freeze the frame and take a look at the information. You're here because you care about biodiversity and we're going to talk about the ways that we can build a thriving, robust ecosystem together. This is what we'll cover today. Biodiversity, ecosystems and cities, what are native plants and how do they support biodiversity, gardening for biodiversity, building habitat, building a food web, plant communities and biodiversity, biodiversity resources and engaging with biodiversity. So biodiversities, ecosystems and cities. We'll talk about what is biodiversity, what are ecosystems, what are healthy ecosystems, ecosystem threats, insect declines, how parks are vital but they're not enough, and how cities can enhance biodiversity. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is all the living participants from one area, the variety of plants, animals, mushrooms, and microorganisms that evolved together. Species that evolve together thrive together. Biodiversity is the foundation of functioning ecosystems. Biodiversity is not just a variety of plants from anywhere. It's plants from a specific place. So what are ecosystems and how do they function? An ecosystem is a geographic area where plants and animals, mushrooms and mic microorganisms, in other words, biodiversity, evolve together to thrive in local weather and topography and soil. So in San Francisco, for instance, our, our Western plants thrive in the fog and the wind and the sandy soil that we have. Every participant in an ecosystem depends on every other participant, either directly or indirectly. Ecosystems provide what its participants need to survive. Food, clean air, clean water, medicine, shelter, carbon absorption, and temperature management. So what are the signs of a healthy ecosystem? A healthy ecosystem has got all of its participants. It's got all of its plants and animals, insects, mushrooms, and microorganisms. It's got all of the functions. It can provide those functions for all of, of its participants, the food, clean air, clean water, medicine, shelter, carbon absorption, and temperature management. And it's resilient. It can recover from disturbances and extreme weather events. Some of the signs of a healthy ecosystem include having caterpillars and the chewed leaves that caterpillars, um, the caterpillars use, bird nests, bee nests, amphibians and predators, and we will talk more about that. There are unfortunately a lot of threats to our ecosystem here in San Francisco and to ecosystems across the planet. Pollution, herbicide, pesticides are reducing the insects that are at the base of that food web. Invasive species are, are displacing our native species. There's a East Coast American bullfrog that is brought a fungus with it that is infecting all of our amphibians and killing them off. Climate change is changing our weather patterns. We have, um, we're hotter, we're colder, we're both wetter and drier. Overexploitation with the Franklin bumblebee, they took that bumblebee from California and they put it in hot houses to pollinate tomatoes because honeybees can't pollinate anything 
that uh, needs buzz pollination like tomatoes. And then they released some of them back into the wild. They had, they caught, they had caught a, a honeybee um, disease and now all of our Franklin bumblebees are gone. Co-extinction. So if you have caterpillars that depend on a particular plant and that plant goes away, then the caterpillars go too. And then all of the critters that depend on eating that caterpillar also die. Networks, all of these things are connected. Functional diversity. So a lot of different functions happen as part of an ecosystem. Specifically, pollination is really important to plants. And we'll talk more about that later. There are a lot of different pollinators, but every time we lose a kind of insect that could be a pollinator, that reduces the robustness of our pollination. Genetic diversity. We are losing some of our species and um, when they are in smaller habitats, they, they lose their genetic diversity and so they become less, less robust. Spatial and time, when we got that climate change issue and we have things um, hotter and colder and our rainy season is different, it means that when we have birds and insects hatching, they may not be hatching at the same time. And so it may be difficult for them to find food. Abundance and biomass, that is a big deal. It's one of the ways that scientists are measuring the health of ecosystems and just the total amount of insects is declining. Habitat loss and fragmentation isn't as uh, isn't discussed as often, but it is a big deal. It turns out that if you take a large green space and you pave down the middle of it to put up buildings up, then anything that can fly may be able to get between the two smaller areas. But if you're hopping or crawling or walking or slithering, you're going to have trouble getting getting from one area to the other to find food and mates. So these are just some of our ecosystem threats. Insect declines are specifically a problem. Insects are the, are the creatures that can eat leaves. Most of us, most, most animals can't eat leaves. Leaves don't want to be eaten. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to be pollinated. They want their seeds to be sowed, but they don't want to be eaten. Insects co-evolve with plants. And so when we lose insects, we lose all of the creatures that eat them. Caterpillars and specifically are the soft protein filled, either hot dogs or tofu, depending on how you want to think about it, of the, of the, of the world. And caterpillars evolved with native plants. Most caterpillars can only eat the leaves of one plant or one kind of local native plant. So if we don't have native plants, we don't have caterpillars. And if we don't have caterpillars, we don't have baby birds. So we've been losing a lot of our land-based birds. The seabirds, the seabird parents will chew up food and feed it to their baby, baby birds. But land-based birds, almost all of them depend on feeding those baby birds caterpillars and baby birds can't adjust to another kind of food. So what we've been thinking for the last hundred years is, oh, we'll just stick nature in parks and nature reserves, and then we'll still have all the nature that we need. And it turns out that's not working. We've got separate researchers in Germany and Puerto Rico looking at the amount of insects in nature preserves over time and seeing an enormous reduction in just the sheer quantity of insects. Again, if you don't have insects, you don't have the rest of the wildlife in your system. Less than 4% of the United States is national parks, state parks, and protected areas. So parks alone are not going to save our ecosystem. We have to, we have, to have a different way of approaching how we plant. Cities in the United States take up over 5% of our land. So what can cities do? Here we are in a city, so much of it's paved, 68% of it is paved. And every plant we add is an opportunity to feed biodiversity. It's a choice. We can either plant something that will feed our system or we can plant lifeless, what is called urban, <laughs> urban furniture. We're very lucky that the San Francisco Estuary Institute a local um, science-based institute was funded to 
to write a report that they call Matri Making Nature City. It is available for free on the internet. It's very easy to read. It's beautifully illustrated. And they looked at what are the success factors for any city in enhancing biodiversity. And those success factors are plant native plants have habitat diversity. So big trees, medium shrubs, smaller shrubs, ground covers, green patch size, things like the Presidio and Golden Gate Park. Having large patches helps with the different kinds of nature that we can support. It's very important though that we add green corridors as stepping stones between those green patches so that we've got wildlife who are able to travel from one larger patch to another. So all of our homes, our gardens, our patios, our balconies, and business and institutional green spaces, they can be part of those green corridors. And the quality of the green space, that means native plants, no invasive plants, reduce the introduced non-native plants because they don't feed anyone and reduce lawn because it doesn't feed anyone. And take special care of water and large trees. For instance, Lake Merced and the underground aquifer that we have underneath Sunset Boulevard and some of Golden Gate Park. We need to take very, very good care of those. So why plant native plants? Native plants evolved here in San Francisco. Take a look at that upper left-hand chart. In seven miles by seven miles, we have so many different kinds of geology. And underneath that, we have three fog and wind belts. In the upper right, we have an enormous amount of rainfall variation from month to month, but also within months. Our rainfall in San Francisco, our yearly rainfall can be as little as seven inches and as much as 50 inches if we get a lot of atmospheric rivers. So I mean, take a look at January and December, there can be an enormous amount of variation just within a month. The plants that evolved here are drought tolerant and they're biodiversity friendly. And native plants are the base of the food web. Those caterpillars that we talked about that co-evolved with, with the leaves, they are the ones that feed our birds and feed the rest of our food web. Doug Tallamy, a researcher at the University of Delaware, was the first one to take a look at all of the different plants, native and introduced, in the Delaware area and determine how many different butterfly and moth caterpillars used that plant for, for food and determined that those plants are all very different in terms of which caterpillars use them and how many caterpillars they can support. And then the US Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service paid Doug Tallamy's lab to compile this information for every county in the United States. So that, that data is on the National Wildlife Federation's website under Native Plant Finder. And this is the, the, at least the top of the list for San Francisco County. We've got uh, our, our willows, oaks, and cherries are the top caterpillar support plants. Our coast live oak is pretty big, it's over 200 caterpillars and it's also 70 feet by 70 feet. If you have room for an oak, please put that in. If you have room for a willow and you've got a, a damp space, please put that in. The rest of our plants are also wonderful. Our currants support over 100. Our stunningly beautiful California lilac supports over 100 caterpillars. Our big leaf maple supports over 100 caterpillars. So these plants are the best ways we can feed our, our biodiversity. Introduced plants just haven't been here long enough for our caterpillars to have a coevolution ability to use them and eat their leaves. Introduced plant leaves feed between zero and two insects. Introduced plants, they're just not native. They're native from somewhere, they're just not native from here. And native plants evolved in plant communities. So San Francisco in our seven miles by seven miles, because we have so many different soil types and so many varieties of weather, we have a bunch of different plant communities. We have grasslands and oak woodlands. 
We have a separate kind of grasslands on our serpentine rocky soil. We have coastal dune scrub and dunes that both evolved on sand. And the interesting thing about plant communities is that they are resilient to climate change. They have evolved together over thousands of years and they have seen it all in terms of California weather. We can be very dry, we can be very wet. They can deal with fog and wind. They're really great and very, very robust when they are planted together. So let's get into the details about gardening for biodiversity. We're gonna talk about building habitat, building a food web, and gardening with those plant communities to maximize our biodiversity. I'm going to do some summaries on the sandy soil. I'm going to include the coastal and the dune, dune scrub and the dunes. Clay soil, I'm going to include the oak woodlands and the grasslands, and then a separate chart on serpentine grasslands. Let's talk about building habitat. To build habitat, select plants from your local plant community to maximize climate resilience, the variety of wildlife homes, and a variety of wildlife food. To the extent that it fits into your space, in other words, don't stick a, a what will be eventually a 70 foot tall by 70 foot wide oak in a very tiny space. Please, please respect that space size. It will be best for you and your neighbors if you do. <laughs> But within the space that you have, consider varying the height and the density, evergreen and deciduous plants, so that a variety of different birds can, can get the habitat that they expect to have. Please leave your leaves on the ground. Caterpillars, once they're ready to transform into butterflies and moths, crawl away from the leaves that they were chewing on so that birds can't find them and then they wrap themselves in a cocoon. They hide underneath leaves in the ground. We need to give them some place to hide. The leaves on the ground also put nutrients back into the soil. And if you can, please consider adding a bird bath or a bubbler uh, as a wildlife water source. It's really important for birds. One of the advantages to having a variety of different height plants is that you get a variety of different root lengths. And it's the roots and the root lengths and the mushroom connective um, wood wide web that gives us resilience to climate change. There are a lot of habitat specialists among our wildlife. Our bees, there are, there are native bees and they nest in bunch grasses. Are they nest in wood? Are they nest in the ground? Caterpillars, hide in leaves on the ground. There are a bunch of birds, the dark-eyed junco likes to nest on the ground. Those um, troublemaking looking <laughs> red-tailed hawk chicks, those nests are in tall trees. And that northern flicker, it depends on having a cavity nest. Our snowy plover only will nest on dunes and only with native plants. It won't nest where there's invasive plants. If there's ice plant or pampas grass, it won't nest there. And we've got a, a couple of creatures that nest in pristine dunes. That silver digger bee, we thought that was extinct. That's one of our native bees here in San Francisco. The Presidio restored some of their dunes. They took out the invasive plants and they added native plants and that silver digger bee came back. It nests inside the dunes. And then that amazing glowworm that also nests inside dunes. For all of you who wish we could have fireflies, there aren't any fireflies west of the Rocky Mountains. They're, they only exist east of the Rocky Mountains, but we do have that wonderful glowworm, the Western glowworm beetle. And we've got it in our pristine dunes all the way down to Mora Bay. So we've got that, but only when we have nice pristine dunes with native plants on them. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about our food web because there's a lot going on with the food web. We'll talk about plant roots and the mushrooms that connect them. We'll talk about native plants, native plant pollinators, planting a year round pollinator buffet, plant seed nut and berry distributors, plant leaf eaters, specialist plant eaters, specifically those caterpillars and some bees, 
soft insect eaters, crunchy insect eaters, and rodent, bird, mammal, reptile, and amphibian eaters. Our native plants evolved in our native soil on, with our native topology and weather, but the thing that helps them survive all of the variety of California's climate is that their root systems end up being connected by a special mushroom network called mycorrhizae. It creates something that is jokingly called the wood wide web. And that fungal network, that this that thin layer of, of mushrooms, that sends water and sugar and, and soil nutrients back and forth among plants, plants with different kinds of roots, different length roots, so that all of the plants in a plant community can survive and be resilient to disturbances, drought and floods and climate change and fires. There's a lot of really great information about this on the internet. Dr. Suzanne Samard has got some wonderful talks. Paul Stamets has got some wonderful talks. And California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena is going to have J.R. Blair talk about mycorrhizae this November 5th in a free talk in their speaker series. Strongly recommend you sign up for that. It's going to be fascinating. This is how the soil helps our native plants and our native plant communities survive our dry summers and survive climate change. But almost all of this talk is about, is about native plants. The thing to keep in mind about plants is that they can take energy from the sun and build plant parts and none of the rest of us can. That is something that plants can do, the rest of us cannot. So we depend on eating plants or eating someone that ate plants to, to get our nutrition. We, we don't get nutrition other than a little bit of vitamin D from sunlight. So plants make their plant parts out of sunlight and carbon dioxide and soil nutrients and water. When native plants eat sunlight, they transfer that sun's energy to the rest of the food web when wildlife eats, eats those plants. If we have, if we have other plants, um, introduced plants and invasive plants, they may have uh, been able to grow, but our wildlife can't necessarily eat them. So let's think like a plant. What does a plant want? A plant is stuck somewhere. It wants to be pollinated. Pollination is so important to, to our ecosystem, so important to biodiversity, that a bunch of different creatures have evolved to pollinate plants. Bees are the most effective pollinators, but butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, beetles, flies, midges, wasps, bats, and gnats also pollinate. There are over 1,500 species of native California bees and over 200 species of San Francisco butterflies and moths that evolved to ensure that our plants get pollinated. Honeybees are not native to North or South America. They are native to Europe and to Asia and they were brought here as tiny little cattle they, they live in hives that have 50,000 individuals. They need an acre of flowers every day for, honeybird, for honeybees to get enough for a hive, hive to, to eat and survive. Let's compare that to bumblebees. Our native bumblebee has a colony of about eight individuals, eight versus 50,000. So my small backyard can support two bumblebee families and a hummingbird family with my neighbor's um, native plants as well in, in their courtyards and a bunch of different butterfly and moth families. I wouldn't be able to support a honeybee hive with the, with the amount of flowers that I can grow, but I can support my native pollinators. So please, please don't add any more honeybee hives to San Francisco. It doesn't actually help our biodiversity. Please plant our native plants so that we can encourage our native pollinators to thrive. 
that's going to be the thing that makes our um, native plants the happiest. And please consider planting a year-round flower buffet. All of those little white stickers show you how many different caterpillar species each one of those different plants can support, can feed in, in terms of their leaves. The advantage to planting a native plant to feed your pollinators is that you are also feeding your caterpillars, which is feeding your baby, baby birds and a lot of other wildlife. The advantage to a year round buffet, we have a lot of nectar and pollen eating pollinators that are here through our rainy season. They're here year round. That Anna's hummingbird, those families are here around the year round. They don't want to migrate. They can migrate. They'd rather not. None of us want to migrate. You want to wake up in the morning and get breakfast. They feel the same way. So the, the rainy season plants, those winter blooming plants are very important. Please consider planting a manzanita, a barberry, or a currant. And also please consider planting something that blooms in the summer. Most of the California natives bloom between March and May because at that point the plant has gotten all of its rain for the year and so it knows how much energy it can expend on flowering to attract pollinators. Those plants that bloom in the winter are taking a chance and the plants that are blooming in the summer, they know how much rain they got. A lot of other plants are just hoping for the next rainy season. These plants are blooming during the summer and so that's keeping our pollinators fed and alive and happy. What else do plants want? So plants got pollinated, yay! And now they've produced seeds or nuts and fruits and berries and they want those seeds, nuts, fruits, and berries to be eaten. They want them to be eaten and taken away by someone who will take them far from the parent plant so that the baby plants aren't taking up the parent plant's resources in terms of sunlight and, and water and nutrients. So they love having birds. Birds can take a seed really far. Coyotes, interestingly, will also eat seeds, nuts, fruits, and berries. Their favorite food are rodents, but they are omnivores just like people. There are rodents like rabbits and squirrels and mice and gophers, again, coyotes' favorite food. All of these creatures will take those seeds as far as possible. People, it turns out, are plants favorite, favorite, favorite food distributors. We have taken plants around the world when we decide that their seeds and nuts and fruits and berries are sufficiently delicious. We have edible native plants right here in San Francisco that we can eat ourselves and share with the, the rest of the creatures around us. Keep in mind, that that year round pollinator buffet that you put in so that you could feed the birds and uh, you could feed the hummingbirds and the bees and the butterflies. When you plant that year round pollinator buffet, you end up with a year round seed, nut, fruit and berry buffet. It's wonderful. So it's a great way of keeping our biodiversity and our wildlife fed. What do plants not want? Plants do not want their leaves chewed on. Their leaves are what helps them absorb sunlight and that helps them grow new roots or new leaves or more seeds. They don't want their leaves eaten. And so a lot of them developed chemicals that are toxic to a lot of creatures. When you think about the number of leaves that you personally can eat, there's a lot you can't because those leaves are bad for you. The same thing with caterpillars. They evolved to eat either one plant, one type of plant, or just a very small set of plants. And they can't evolve to eat another kind of plant. That, that interesting looking caterpillar and eggs, that's our beautiful pipevine swallowtail butterfly. It can eat exactly one plant as a caterpillar or an egg. And that plant is the California Dutchman's pipevine. When you look at that, you are, for, for the systems people and the engineers out there, that is both a bug and a feature. It's important for the health of our ecosystems that we have those native plants so that we've got all those caterpillars to feed everybody else in the food web. 
and also so we can have butterflies and moths in our life. There are a lot of other delicious insects. Oh, sorry, delicious goes on the next, next slide. But there are a lot of other insects that also eat leaves and millipeds eat uh, decaying leaves. And then we've got a lot of other um, creatures that, that will eat leaves in addition to seeds and nuts and berries. The important thing to remember is that native plants are feeding those caterpillars. That means we have more birds. And this is an important part of a healthy ecosystem, those chewed leaves, we've got a functioning, healthy ecosystem. So please celebrate when you have chewed leaves. Young insects, caterpillars, they cannot adjust to eating those introduced plants. So please plant native. So some of our pollinators are food specialists. You'll remember that we had habitat specialists and so many of our wildlife are habitat specialists. Many fewer are food specialists, but those caterpillars, they're all specialist plant eaters, plant leaf eaters. Some baby bees need very specific pollen. The adult bees can eat all kinds of pollen and nectar, but the baby bees for the sunflower bee and the morning glory bee specifically need us to plant those plants so that there can be that pollen when they grow up. And baby birds, although not specialist on a specific kind of caterpillar, are specifically, especially our land birds, specifically caterpillar eaters. It takes between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to feed one nest of chicks. So please, please plant native to get the caterpillars that we need to feed our birds. Soft insects, so lots and lots of creatures eat soft insects. Baby birds, adult birds, spiders and damselflies, dragonflies and lady beetles, beetles and wasps. Those soft insects are that way we transition leaves, plant leaves, to the rest of the food web. Crunchy insects. There are a lot of lot of wildlife participants that love to eat insects newts and frogs and salamanders and lizards and turtles and snakes and bats and spiders and damselflies and dragonflies and adult birds and beetles and that coyote again an omnivore so this is how we're transitioning from the plants to mammals and amphibians and reptiles this is how we transition plant matter from the sun to the plants to the insects, to this wide variety of, of ecosystem participants and biodiversity. When we have all of those wonderful amphibians, especially they are particularly good at eating, for instance, mosquitoes at all parts of their life cycle. So we want them to be in our environment so that that stays nice. So our environment stays nice and healthy for us. And closer to the top of the food chain, we have all of the, the creatures that eat rodents and mammals and reptiles and amphibians. So we've got snakes and kestrels and hawks and owls and falcons and crows and foxes and coyotes and people that will eat closer to the top of the food chain. We have them here in San Francisco. So it's wonderful if we have all of the rest of our ecosystem available for them to eat. Let's talk about planting in plant communities and how that supports biodiversity. When we garden with our local plant community, we maximize biodiversity. We also maximize our resilience to climate change due to that root and mushroom sharing network in the soil. So I've broken this into three sets of charts. There's the sandy soil, coastal dune scrub and dunes. There's the clay soil, oak woodlands and grasslands, and there's the serpentine grasslands. And yes, we have more soil types than this, but we'll just talk about these five plant communities. On our sandy soil, we've got, this is just a subset of the wonderful and gorgeous plants and some of the, the beautiful pollinators that we have associated with those plants. 
On our California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena website, under our biodiversity resources, we have separate plant community lists for the coastal dune scrub and for the dune plants. When we plant these plants, we get this kind of wildlife. It's wonderful, it's amazing, it's gorgeous. For clay soil, we have oak woodlands and grassland plants. A lot of our birds are seed eaters as adults. They like insects and they like seeds. In fact, more than they like berries. So it's important that you plant some grassland plants, especially if you live in an area that would have had grassland. Those seeds will be much appreciated by the seed eaters that we have. And this is just a, a subset of the trees that we have, the flowers and grasses and the shrubs. That oak is, is the keystone plant for the oak woodland community. And take a look at that. That, that oak is on the far left and on the far right, we have the California oak grass. Look at the length of that root system. That's at the Oakland Museum. That lets us see what those root systems can do to help hold our soil for things like earthquakes. When we plant these plants, we get these wonderful sets of wildlife. So many different pollinators and birds, predators and bees. San Francisco has got serpentine grassland. So our grasses are very important for that. We've got grasses and flowers and trees and shrubs, unusual plants that developed specifically on that serpentine soil. Got a plant community list for that on our website as well. If you happen to live on serpentine, there are all kinds of beautiful beautiful plants you can grow. And then you get these amazing variety of wildlife. These are our seed eating birds, the lazuli bunting and the dark eyed junco and the Pacific soap flycatcher and the violet green swallow and the black phoebe, in addition to bees and butterflies and moths and lizards. We get wonderful um, pollinators and birds and all kinds of fabulous wildlife when we plant our local native plants in their plant communities. Doug Tallamy, the University of Delaware researcher who looked into how many plants, how many caterpillar species are fed by each kind of plant leaf, has a recent book called Nature's Best Hope. And these are his top 10 calls to action for those of us who are intent on contributing to biodiversity to plant our local native keystone plants, oaks, willows, and cherries, to plant a variety of local native plants, to plant for caterpillars and specialist pollinators, to build sites for caterpillars to transform, so leave those native leaves on the ground. He calls it building a conservation hardscape. So use motion sensors for lights so that you reduce the amount of, of constant light outside during the night, it, it confuses insects, and to use a yellow LED light bulb if you do need to have lights and to consider installing a water bubbler, and to please avoid spraying insect, insecticide, herbicide, and fungicide this way, at least outdoors, your ecosystem has a chance to function. And please, please remove lawn. Lawn doesn't feed anyone. In the United States, we have so much lawn, it's the size of New England. Please remove invasive species. They displace biodiversity. They don't have the predators here to chew on their leaves, and they they are getting in the way of us feeding the rest of our food web. And consider coordinating with your neighbors to create those stepping stones to create wildlife food, food corridors. And please advocate for native plants and plant communities with cities, corporations, universities, civic organizations, and homeowner associations, especially homeowner associations. We can't afford to have the post-World War II lawn with a couple of random shrubs as the requirement for people to, to landscape anymore. We, we can't afford it. That lawn isn't feeding anyone. Those random shrubs from elsewhere aren't feeding anyone. Emphasize feeding wildlife, emphasize feeding caterpillars and, and butterflies and help convince your neighbors that this is, there's a, a new way. It's, it's the 2000s. It's time to take a new approach to a, a new aesthetic and contributing to our local biodiversity. 
if what you have is a balcony or a paved patio, you can still garden for biodiversity. We have a lot of shallow rooted annuals and bulbs and succulents that do beautifully in, in pots. We have a, a container plant list on our website, California Native Plant Society, Yerba Buena, Biodiversity Resources. These are just a few. There are so many beautiful plants that grow just fine in pots. And you will also be able to create one of those stepping stones in that green corridor to help support our native bees and butterflies. So let's look at some biodiversity resources. We'll look at plant lists, uh, plant butterfly selection tools, sources for native plants, how to find out more information about plant communities, bloom period tools from CalFlora, and biodiversity and ecosystem books. So this is the website where you can get all of those plant lists. This is, and they're all free. Um, plant community lists that ranking from Doug Tallamy about the plant to caterpillar relationship so that you can choose that highest value plant to, or, or choose a highest value set of plants to add to your garden. Butterfly plants, hummingbird plants, bee plants, edible plants, edible native plants, shade plants and container plants all available for free on our website. California Native Plant Society at the state level writes and supports a tool called CalScape. It's got all of the information about every native plant in California, how big they get, what kind of soil they, they need, what kind of water they need, and what kind of butterflies and moths they support. CalScape does have a radius of 10 miles, and keep in mind we're a bunch of different kinds of soil types in seven miles by seven miles in San Francisco. So double check when CalScape recommends a plant that it really is appropriate for your soil type. CalScape also has a, a tab for nurseries, and so you can find nurseries, both online and in-person nurseries, that will let you buy not only the plants, but the bulbs and the annual seeds. All of this is a CalScape's um, website. CalFlora provides that, um, has a, got a wonderful bloom period tool that helps you plan your year round pollinator buffet. It also has either a 10 mile or a countywide search choice. And again, we have too many soil types for that in California, in, in San Francisco. So be sure to check the soil type for any plant that it recommends. The San Francisco Department of Environment has written the SF Plant Finder tool and it's a wonderful tool to include plant community information for our local plants. Las Palitas Nursery is an online nursery in the Central Coast, and it's got a fantastic set of information about the plant communities across California. It's a wonderful place. There are some fantastic books about biodiversity. Wonderful book by Kate Marion Child. She's up in Mendocino. She's written a book called Secrets of the Oak Woodlands. It's about how all of the different oak woodland um, plant and animal and uh, mushroom um, wildlife interact with each other and how they support each other so that they can all thrive. San Francisco Public Library has got a lot of wonderful books, a couple of them on planting with plant communities, um, lots of California native plant gardening books, California plant Plants by Matt Ritter and Designing California Native Gardens both talk about how to garden with plant communities and the California Wildlife Habitat Garden is a wonderful book about specifically planting for wildlife. Doug Tallamy, I keep going on and on, but this is the man who, whose realization that, and data that supports all the fact that different plants support different caterpillars and how caterpillars support the rest of the food, food web made all the difference for me. He's got a bunch of books. They're available through the library. Uh, ebook as well as real book. And he's got a couple of California centric lectures that he did for the California Native Plant Society that those are available for free on YouTube, one that he did for Southern California, and one for the Santa Clara Valley chapter. He's got a website bringing nature home, it's got information, and then all of that data was collected for every county in the United States at the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder site. San Francisco, 
San Francisco Bay Area has not one, but two world-class B research institutions. We've got Gretchen Lebune and her team at San Francisco State, and we've got Brett Gordon Frankie and his team at University of California, Berkeley, and they have both written wonderful books about bees. Strongly recommend them both. The library has them both. The Sibley Guide to Birds has got, it is a wonderful thing to have, frankly, hardcover or, or, or real book, um, in your home so that you can identify the birds that are outside. They're gonna be spooked if you go outside when they're out there, but you can watch them through a window and uh, it's really fun to identify them. Gordon Frankie's lab has got a website called Help a Bee. Gretchen Lebune's lab has got a citizen science project called Great Sunflower Org. Golden Gate Audubon is our local chapter of the Audubon Society. They've got a lot of good information about native plants and Cornell's ornithology lab, which means birds, has got a tool called eBird, fascinating information recently published uh, in a tool about how to watch bird migrations online. So eBird at the link below. Mushrooms. San Francisco Library has got so many of our local native mushroom books. We are very lucky to have the Mycological Society of San Francisco. Mycological is a fancy word for mushroom. They have mushroom field trips and workshops and lectures and a bunch of their members have written some really fantastic books. Strongly recommend that you don't just get a mushroom field, field book, field guide and go out and look for mushrooms. Please, please don't do that. A lot of them will kill you. Please go on a guided field trip with an experienced person from the Mycological Society to learn to identify mushrooms. They're really, really fun people. And California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena is going to have that free mycorrhiza lecture from J.R. Blair on November 5th. So in addition to planting for biodiversity, there are a bunch of other ways you can engage with biodiversity. There's citizen science, native plant community restoration, native plant propagation, biodiversity advocacy, becoming a naturalist, just asking questions and doing your own research. iNaturalist is a wonderful tool from the California Academy of Sciences that lets us identify the, the birds and insects and wildlife and plants that we see, upload that information so that it can be mapped so that we can all figure out where do these, uh, where do these wildlife live? What plants are they associating themselves with? If you want to go see what uh, a plant looks like when it's bigger than what you're going to buy at a nursery, it's a really great place to see it. When you add your information, real scientists use the information that's available on iNaturalist to help them make, uh, make assumptions and resolve some of their questions and research using our data. There is a version of, so iNaturalist, you can choose your privacy setting on that. There is a version for children called Seek by iNaturalist where the privacy setting is just, there's just one privacy setting and it's very, very high. Just want that, they, they wanna make sure that the children are protected, but it's a wonderful tool. If you have a young naturalist in your, in your household or your greater family or, or your neighbors and friends, it's a fantastic tool to learn to identify uh, the wildlife around us. A lot of restoration opportunities. There is the Nature in the City. They have been working on creating a green corridor for a couple of decades now. And this is in the sandy part of the city over by Hawk Hill. That fabulous looking green butterfly is the coastal green hair streak. There are two plants that it can use for, for its caterpillars. There is the coast buckwheat and there is deerweed. And so they have been encouraging neighbors to plant those plants so that the lady coastal green hair streaks can fly back and forth between the hills because the male coastal green hair streaks are what are called hill topping butterflies. And so they hang out at the top of the hills to meet the ladies, but the ladies are the ones who fly back and forth and need something to eat and something for their caterpillars to eat, for their eggs and caterpillars to eat. San Bruno Mountain Watch. San Bruno Mountain is that mountain at the south side of San Francisco between San Francisco and the San Francisco airport. That middle butterfly, the Mission Blue butterfly is the first butterfly that was uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act back in the 70s, which is why we still have so much of that mountain undeveloped. 
San Bruno Mountain Watch removes invasive plants and has a nursery to propagate new plants so that they can restore the habitat, not only for the mission blue butterfly, but for the endangered San Bruno elfin butterfly and for the endangered variable checker spot butterfly. My group, California Native Plant Society, also does res has restoration opportunities. We're working with San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department and with the Department of Public Works with a variety of restoration projects around the city. And that's all available on our calendar online. And Golden Gate Audubon has definitely gotten into the, the native plant world because they recognize that if we don't have native plants, we won't have our, our native birds. And so they're working with the San Francisco port to, to fix uh, Heron's Head Park and remove the invasive plants and add native plants so they can enhance that as a birding habitat. Bunch of different places where you can learn to propagate plants. You don't need to know how to do this, they will teach you. I believe National Park Services Presidio Trust Nursery is still closed to volunteers due to COVID. You're welcome to contact the rest of those nurseries and find out if they are um, working with volunteers, but in a, a socially distanced kind of way so that native plants can continue to be propagated and then added into our landscape. Join me in advocating for native plants. The California Native Plant Society and the Golden Gate Audubon Society are both avid um, advocates for native plants. All of our different city agencies all make their own plant choices. Recreation and Park makes different choices than Department of Public Works, which is different than the Municipal Transit uh, Organization, which is different than the libraries and the schools and the port and the Treasure Island Development Association. So they all make their own um, decisions. So if you want to come advocate with me, that would be so much fun. It would, it would help a great deal. There are also neighborhood associations and open space groups having additional people to advocate for natives to be planted when all of these areas are, are going to be enhanced with new plantings. To advocate to plant the natives there is so important. We don't want to have introduced plants be lifeless urban furniture. We want every plant we plant to feed the rest of our ecosystem. Become a naturalist. University of California has a California Naturalist Certification Program and City College of San Francisco connects with that program. And, uh, and so that's a great way to become a naturalist. Bob Paul did that. And Golden Gate Audubon Society in conjunction with the California Academy of Sciences has a master birder program. Wonderful ways to learn more about the wildlife around you. And you can just do your own research. There are a bunch of local native plants for which we do not have caterpillar information. I personally would love to know which plants, which caterpillars like to eat the leaves of our beautiful silk tassel bush that loves fog and wind and sandy soil. California wax myrtle, it loves fog and wind and sandy soil. Sea pink, Brodiaea, blue dicks, and, and ethereal spear. Great plants, fantastic for wildlife. I just don't know which caterpillars use them. So consider planting them and investigating and then, then publish that information so that we can all learn from it. Open questions include, if plant communities are missing some of their plant species, how do those missing plants affect wildlife and how do the missing plants affect climate resilience of the plant community? And how do native root systems and mycorrhizae interact with root systems from introduced plants? There's many more questions than this. Go ahead and type more of those into the Q&A because all of us are going to learn from each other. Thank you so much to all of the people on iNaturalist who took all the wonderful photos that I've used and all of the professionals who have taken the wonderful photos and all of the research that's being done on things like can parks support nature? This is the fourth of a series of Gardening in San Francisco series for the San Francisco Public Library. All of these are, all of these talks are available on YouTube. We are the California Native Plant Society. We have free lectures, free hikes, opportunities for restoration and advocacy. Lots of free plant lists at, available at our biodiversity resources, so. Thank you so much for being here today and taking, um, taking your time to come and join us. So let's take some questions.
Ah, oh, Luis, um, how can you advocate for this kind of gardening in our communities? Are there resources in Spanish? California Native Plant Society at the state level has got some resources in Spanish and the Golden Gate Audubon has got some resources in Spanish. If you wouldn't mind, um, please go ahead and contact me uh, through the California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena website because we can work offline. I would like to get all of what we've done available um, in, in Spanish. I, I apologize for so far, so much of it has been in English, but I appreciate you asking that. The library can probably help with that. Oh, wonderful, thank you. So what else do we have? Um, good plants for the outer Richmond. So you are probably on dune plants and in sand. In sand. We do have a, a long list at that, um, the, the bottom link there, the California Native Plant Society of Buena Biodiversity Resources. We've got the dune and the dune scrub plants. Are there resources to contributing for biodiversity in small spaces like patios and balconies? I understand that trees aren't feasible. Yeah, we do have a plant list for container gardening and it will make all the difference when you plant for our local pollinators. They, they really appreciate it. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, I noticed there's a hand raised. I don't know if that person wanted to speak. Can I see that? I think it is um, Lisa, Lessa. Would you like to ask your question? I can unmute you. You are unmuted. Lessa Mart Martling. Oh, sorry, you're not unmuted. Now you are. Um, thank you. That was really a lovely talk. Um, when you're planting things in your on your balcony, what type of soil should you use for California natives? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you for asking that. So if you've got, uh, if you're going to plant succulents, and I have not done this, but I have um, heard through the community. That, so thank you so much for the community, community members who uh, chimed in on the chat when I talked about planting for pollinators. Use a cactus soil mix for the dune plants, the dune scrub plants, and the succulents. For everything else, you can use a regular potting mix, but you definitely need that faster draining soil for, for pots that, um, for succulents and, and the dune scrub plants. Oh, thank you. Let's see, do we have any other questions? Do we have any questions from YouTube? Anissa? It looks like Bob already took care of those questions. Okay, wonderful. Oh, Bob, and thank you for, for talking with Luis. Yeah, there is a San Francisco organization called Poder. Um, they are specifically, um, oops, doing work. Uh, this is the uh, people organizing to demand equality. So they're specifically or, um, doing everything in Spanish. And we have some other hands raised. Anissa, can you see that? Also, there are some new questions piling up in Q&A. Okay, great. Tracy's asking, with the recent California wildflowers, are there certain plants that may be more important in contributing to biodiversity to get started on in greater numbers than others? Tracy, really good question. And yes, California Native Plant Society at the state level has got a, a guide to recovering from wildfires. There are wildflower, there are plants that specifically thrive from wildflowers and our California Lilac is one of them, the Ceanothus. So that plant can survive in full sunlight. Um, its seeds actually need fire to, to, to be scarred, to, to grow. And so there are a variety of additional other plants that, that are the, the best plants to plant, but it's all in the California Native Plant Society. Check the state website 
to, to find that fire recovery guide resource. Tess, yes, all plants purify air um, and are certain species more effective? I don't know that. Uh, they all purify air by having um, pollu air pollutants um, catch onto their leaves and then be washed off onto the soil. But I don't know that certain species are more effective than others. Jennifer, do I recommend amending my soil when starting a garden? Um, Jennifer, I, I don't do any soil amendments. I, I garden on clay, so I just don't. On sand, you really wouldn't wanna do that because all of those sand plants are expecting sandy soil. And good question about the best time to plant natives. Just as soon as the rains start, actually specifically the second rain. So after November 1st, after the second rain, with the last couple of years where our rains have been so late in November, I'm considering changing my mind and making it after the second rain and after December 1st. So December, January, and February, those are the best time to plant native plants. It gives those plants the opportunity to grow their root system during the rainy season. That's when they're expecting to work on their root system. And if I have a healthy native garden, should I avoid stepping on it to not damage the mushrooms, et cetera? There is a lot of debate about that. Um, some people really, some people say that the best mulch you can give your garden is the gardener's footstep just because it means you're outside and you care. Hmm. I, would, I would be a little careful, but those, those networks are pretty resilient. And native plants that are grown in nurseries come with the mycorrhizal fund fungi. I discovered back in the 70s that that made a difference to the success of the plant. And so you'll, you'll be okay. I appreciate you caring about that, but uh, you'll be all right. Any other questions? All right. Anne, would you like to ask your question? You are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm Anne from Petaluma. I just began the uh, bird watcher group. I am the administrator. This has been the most moving program I have ever, ever heard. And I am so thankful that I was a part of it. And thank you so much for sharing. The information is overwhelming. I'm going to do so much. I'm going to do so much more in my yard and share with many, many people. Thank you so much. I'm so glad. Um, the Hallberg Butterfly Garden in Sebastopol has got a fantastic plant list. They've got a bunch of their plants and pictures of their wildlife on iNaturalist. So you might consider looking at their plant list. They're going to be the most appropriate for you. I'm so glad that this will help you. It's going to be fantastic when you plant for birds. Thank you. Other questions? Also I, would, have... I would also... There we go. Sorry, go ahead. I, I would also add that there's a really great YouTube video for people who live up in Petaluma, Sonoma area called Wildscaping for Birds. And I, I think the last name of the woman who gives the presentation is Bowers, but it's just an incredible presentation on YouTube. So Wildscaping for Birds. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> and then we have Tess and has her hand has their hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, hi, so I am in San Rafael working, at, I'm a freshman at Terra Linda High School, and one of our projects this year is to try and improve air quality, but I've already, always been super interested in native plants and improving biodiversity, which is why I asked the question about air purifying, uh, plants that could purify air, and I was wondering if I could, you know, do both simultaneously and if there were any really easy to grow plants that are also beautiful and you could uh, give out to people to both purify air and improve biodiversity. I don't know if it's applicable here, but. Yes, absolutely. That's such a great, such a great idea. And it's a perfect science project. So there are uh, California sages. I think we have over 70. If you go to the Calscape site, it'll tell you which one is local to you. I think you've got purple sage and black sage uh, may be local to you. It's uh, salvia uh, leucophilia and mellifera. Those are very, very easy to grow. And they've got very um, soft, fuzzy leaves because the leaves are trying not to, what's called transpire or lose 
um, lose water. So you might consider comparing something like that, which is very easy to grow in a soft fuzzy leaf. Oh, also the, it's called a bush mallow. It's a Malacca thamnus. It also has soft fuzzy leaves, extremely easy to grow, gorgeous um, cup shaped pink flowers all summer long for bees. Wonderful wildlife plant in terms of caterpillars, also has soft fuzzy leaves, easy to grow from seed, very easy to grow from seed. Uh, and I think your local one is Malacathamnus fasciculatus, but, but check with Calscape. And compare that to something with a shinier leaf. So our barberries, which I think our coast one is Berberis pinnata. Check with Calscape to see which what your local bear, barberry is, but it's going to have a, 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 a shiny leaf. And so you might wanna take a look at air quality with the shiny leaves versus the, the fuzzier leaves. Another plant with a shiny leaf is coffee berry, very easy to grow. So coffee berry is easy to grow. Barberry is easy to grow, Malacca thamnus, the bush, bush mallow is easy to grow, and the salvias are easy to grow. One thing you might consider doing is going to your local native plant nursery. Um, ask them if, tell them what you want to do, call ahead of time and explain what you want to do, and then take a tour through the nursery, feeling the different leaves, and then talk with them about what they recommend for your area but it's a fantastic project and it will be really interesting to see how you decide to measure air quality. I, I love this and please consider um, publishing it. We have the California Native Plant Society at the state level has got two publications. And so you, know, you would be able to contact them and get your data published through them. It would be wonderful to know. Thank you. Um, very briefly, are there like tiny little pot plants as well, like little flowers, indoor, indoor more indoor. Work. So I am a terrible gardener. It's one of the reasons I like native plants because they can survive my neglect and I know nothing about indoor plants. The value to uh, a, a native plant is to have it outdoors to interact with wildlife. But I recognize that if you are trying to do a controlled experiment, you will need to bring them indoors. So if you're looking for a tinier plant, I would recommend looking at our annuals or our bulbs so let's look at, um, yeah. So the blue dicks, the, the brodiaea, the ethereal spear are all short little bulbs and they bloom in May. Um, they don't have constant leaves. The iris does though. Our Douglas iris has got a, a leaf that stays out all year. And um, our annuals are also going to be uh, short and so you'd be able to keep those indoors in pots and we have so many annuals. The, the Larner Seeds is going to be the, west, the best website for that. Annie's Annuals is also a really great website for seeds. So, um, oh, and our, our uh, onions are wonderful. So the, the, a lot of those are going to not always have uh, leaves year round. The lupines might. Look at the lupines. That may be, that may be good. And it would be interesting to compare that with any of our uh, native succulents, the stone crop, um, Dudalea farinosa, the Dudalea, and the sand pygmy weed, which isn't a very pretty name, but it's a really cute plant. They have sort of, uh, if you've seen ice plant, it's got that sort of thick kind of leaf. So that would be another good comparison to a shiny leaf or a soft leaf. All of those you'd be able to grow indoors. We do have a salvia, come to think of it, um, the chia sage, the salvia columbari. You could grow that inside. That's, a, that's an annual. And this way you could include a salvia because they're just so easy to grow. Actually, all of our annuals are easy to grow. The whole point of annuals, when you take a look at our ecosystem, is to have something that can colonize an area that's recently been burned uh, so that something's growing and something's bringing in the pollinators and the birds to bring in more berries and seeds from elsewhere to help recolonize an area. Does that help? 
Thank you so much. That helps a ton. I'm very excited now. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to your research. Please consider um, reaching out to California Native Plant Society State so you can publish this research and also reach out to your local Native Plant Society and, and um, we're going to want to mentor you. Uh, and in fact, you can, if, if you want to be mentored by me, you can reach out to me through our Yerba Buena site. But I absolutely want you to be successful. This is fascinating work and we don't, we don't have this information and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. I will definitely do that. That would be great. Other questions? How inspirational that young person is. Um, we have one hand raised still. One monster, one monster. I'm gonna allow you to unmute. Go ahead. I'm looking for resources for the East Bay and I wanted to know what would be some good edible plants to be growing. I live in El Cerrito and the Berkeley area. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, so edible plants are my particular passion, that Venn diagram between edible plants and native plants. So uh, there are a few edible plants on this very page. All of the 70 California onions are edible and they are entirely edible. The bulbs, the seeds, the flowers, the leaves, it's wonderful. Um, Blue dicks are edible, the bulb needs to be cooked and the flowers are edible. We have on our website, the Yerba Buena website, we have a list of edible plants because I am just crazy about native edible plants. So you can take a look at uh, what grows in San Francisco. I know that you've got some additional ones, you've got additional sages that we don't have. And, um, but you can grow the strawberries that we grow, the blue elderberry. Uh, it, I don't know how big your garden is, but we've got a lot of native edibles that we've got native edible um, uh, hazelnuts and the barberry is a tart edible berry with a lot of pectin. So many wonderful edibles, bulbs, annuals, California poppy seeds are edible. So go take a look at, at our edible plant handouts on our website, and then go ahead and compare that to the Native Here Nursery. It's over across the street from the Tilden Botanic Garden in the, I think that's the Berkeley Hills. That is the nursery that the California Native Plant Society East Bay chapter runs. And they've got fantastic resources about what grows that's local native there, locally native there. And so if you do that combination of what does it say on my handout and what did they have, I think you've just got a few extra sages and otherwise it should be just about this. And I think you also have some additional onions. So you've got a few more plants than I've got, but much the same plants. So good luck with your native edible garden. It is so <laughs> much fun to grow native edibles. Thank this you. This is also a good time to remind people that you've done a presentation on native animals that is archived on the library's YouTube page. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder, Bob. That is true. We do have a YouTube question. Can you point the way for those interested in research on how recent wildfires have changed the local eco landscape? And what, if anything, home gardeners can do to establish a refugee space? Thank you so much. That is such an important question because, because so many of the, the wildlife that we're living in those areas have had to move. Their, their homes and their food sources and their water sources are gone. So if, if you do the, the recommendations that we've, that we've talked about here, where you plant a variety of plants um, that you've got a, a year round um, pollinator garden. So it's producing nectar and pollen and seeds and berries and insects that will help feed so many of the, the wildlife that are having to move. And if you want to start small, start with annuals and bulbs, but 
to the extent that your garden can 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 permit it, um, even putting in a, a small one gallon, the sages grow pretty pretty quickly. The bushmallows grow quickly, and even the coffee berry grows quickly. So putting in some of those those plants that will grow up while you've got annuals to to feed the wildlife. If you have the ability to put in a, a bird bath or a water bubbler, that helps them so much. Um, you may have heard about the bird die-offs in Texas and New Mexico and Arizona because there were so many birds trying to escape the, the wildfires and um, it, was, it was awful. So I appreciate you wanting to plant for a refuge and that's, that's the best way to do it. Start, plant a lot of things, but add those annuals so that you have something um, blooming while the, the perennial plants are getting their root systems established. What I've noticed because I, I refuse to amend my soil is that it will take a one gallon native, native perennial plant about three years to, root, to get its root system deep enough that it then starts working on more leaves and flowers. So having those annuals permit food to be available in the meantime. Any other questions? Well, within the last day or two, I've also posted um, a link to presentations coming up from the California Native Plant Society and they're doing one or they may have already done it. I can't remember. And my computer's chugging too much to get that link for you. But on our California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena chapter Facebook page, there's some links to um, a presentation on fire and you can go to our Instagram page because all of September we were co-blogging with a, another group called Wildfires to um, Wildfire to Wildflowers, and we um, were talking a lot about fire and fire followers. So it's a good place to get some information and ask some questions too. Thank you so much for, for wanting to build a, a refuge for wildlife. I really appreciate it. And so do they. And of Other course, questions? all those links are in that document that I sent out and that I will send out a follow-up email and I'll set it to go out tomorrow. So you'll get it right away. And I'll also put a link to all of the other YouTube videos in there. Thanks for that plug, Bob. And we have no more questions on YouTube. All right. And there's a question about free plants, free native plants uh, from yes. LB. A dream question. Well, it's a dream that may be somewhat fulfilled. We may have extra Ceanothus and California sagebrush to give away um, to local people who will take care of them. Um, we don't know if we'll be able to plant them all out yet, but we had some donations and we grew our own plants to plant out and we may have an excess that we can give away, but um, that is not known yet. If she, if LB emails us, perhaps we can um, hook up and discuss that more. Yeah, if you'll, if you'll go through our California Native Plant Society or Babuina chapter, um, website, there's a way to contact us and give us your contact information. We've got those two. And I think we also have, we may have some coffee berry. And if you're on sandstone, we may have a special manzanita. So <laughs> that is uh, the, the San Francisco Public Works, um, Public Utilities Corporation grew a hundred of them and they want people to, to grow them out. They will want information back on that plant and how it's, how it's surviving and what wildlife it gets but you, we may be able to, to get some, some free plants out to people. We're also interested in contacting um, neighborhood organizations that are wanting to landscape for natives so that we can get some of those extra plants to those neighborhood organizations. Any other questions? All right. All right, that seems like, and it's pretty easy to contact um, our friends here today on their website. 
And that list is very exhaustive. It's, a, it's very massive and growing. Every time Susan comes, it gets another page out of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's pretty good, pretty just deep resource. So follow that, check that out. And we thank you for being with us today and part of the Bay Area Science Fest. Susan and Bob, again, always much appreciation. Email me, let's see what we're gonna do next. Thank you all for being interested in planting for biodiversity and good luck with your gardens. Good night.